The intimations for this evening. Welcome to all who have joined us for our worship service today. Services next Lord's Day, 12 noon and 6.30pm in Port Mahomock. Preacher expect the Reverend John Keddy. Sunday school next week, 11.15am in Church Vestry. The midweek meeting, Wednesday at 7.30pm via Zoom. And all these are subject to God's will. So we now begin our worship of God by singing to God's praise. To his praise in Psalm 116. <coughs> Psalm 116 and singing from the beginning of the psalm. Psalm 116 and singing from the beginning. I love the Lord because my voice and prayers he did hear. I, while I live, will call on him who bowed to me his ear. Of death the cords and sorrows did about me compass round. The pains of hell took hold on me, I grief and trouble found. Upon the name of God the Lord then did I call and say, Deliver thou my soul, O Lord, I do thee humbly pray. God merciful and righteous is, yea, gracious is our Lord. God saves the meek, I was brought low, he did me help afford. O thou my soul, do thou return unto thy quiet rest. For largely low the Lord to thee his bounty hath expressed. For my distress is soul from death. Delivered was by thee, thou didst my morning eyes from tears, my feet from falling free. These verses are Psalm 116 from the beginning. I love the Lord because my voice and prayers he did hear.
We thank thee, Lord, that thou art the God of all comfort. We thank thee that thou dost uh, deliver our feet from falling and our eyes from tears. We are living, O Lord, in a world of tears, great sorrow, and uh, because of sin, as we are reminded in thy word, as we ought to remind ourselves, sorrow follows sin. And um, man in this world is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. And uh, man in this world is as the restless sea, never at rest, never at peace, until and unless we make our peace with thee. Such is the condition. But we thank thee, o Lord, that thou art the one who brings peace into the hearts, into the lives of men and women, sinners like ourselves. Yeah, because the great dispeace, the great unrest, is because of our enmity and our alienation from thee. We are not at peace with God, and God is not at peace with us. God is angry at the wicked every day. But we thank thee, Lord, that thou hast made provision, thou hast taken steps, whereby thine anger is removed, and uh, man is reconciled unto thee. And we thank thee that this is the gospel. The gospel is the means which thou hast devised to bring sinners unto thyself and to reconcile so that they know peace with God. And in this world they know great measures of peace even with their fellow men. Peace of conscience and joy in the Holy Ghost. We pray, Lord, that we therefore would listen to the message of the gospel. This is the message that is for all of us. For we are all sinners by nature and by practice. And we must be reconciled to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank thee that the command is to preach the gospel to every creature. Not just to preach the gospel to some here or there, but to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And we know, Lord, down through the centuries, the past 2,000 years, this has been fulfilled in large measure. The gospel has now spread from the Middle East, from the Roman Empire, throughout the whole world, even to what was called the New World, continents that we didn't know that were not known to exist in Europe. The gospel has spread there. And we thank thee that many have come under not only the sound of the gospel in these places, but under the power of the gospel. For the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And we pray, Lord, that it would be so for each one of us here, as we hear it from time to time, from week to week, uh, and from midweek to midweek, uh, we pray, Lord, that we would not only be hearers of that word, but doers also. It is good to know the gospel, uh, but the gospel will not profit us if we do not mix it, and if it is not mixed with faith in our hearing. We pray, therefore, Lord, that by thy grace we would believe the truth of the gospel and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and rest upon him alone for salvation, as he is freely offered to us in the gospel. As we come, O Lord, we come also confessing our sin in the sight of thee. Thou art a holy God, and we are met at this time in the presence of one who is holy, one who is, is a pure eyes to look upon sin. And if we, O Lord, if God is to look upon us as we are by nature, then he, will, he could not look upon us. He would be offended, and he, he, his, his wrath and his anger would burn against us. But we thank thee, Lord, that thou art not only a holy God, but thou art a merciful God. Thou art a God who loves sinners so much that thou didst give thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of thy love, the love of thy the Son of thy bosom. Thou didst give him over into the hands of wicked and cruel men, whereby he was crucified and slain. But although he was slain and brought under the power of death, he did not remain under the power of death. After three days in the grave, he rose from the dead, and uh, he ascended to thy right hand. And he is there at that time, making intercession for sinners, such as we are, for all who would come unto God and do come unto God by him. We pray, Lord, that we would be in the intercession of Christ through faith in, in him. We pray, Lord, that we at this time would be reminded of our own sin in the presence of thy a holy God, as we have already referred. 
and that we would be conscious, O oh Lord, that even this day we have added to our sin. And if we are outside of Christ, if we've not been reconciled unto God, that sin is still counted against us. It's added to the debt that we owe to the law of God. But we thank Thee that if we are in Christ, although we have sinned, even since we met in thought, word, or deed, and there is no day goes by where we do not sin against Thee in thought, word, and deed. We thank Thee for the blood of Thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the atonement of Christ, which cleanses us from all sin. Praise bless us each one, O Lord, Thou dost know us. We know something about each other, our, circum our circumstances, our individual circumstances, what we can see and what we are told, but there is much that we do not tell others, and that is in order. But everything is known unto Thee. Thou dost know everything about us. Thou dost know the concerns we have. Thou dost know the temptations we have. Thou dost know the difficulties we have in this life. They are all known unto Thee. But we thank Thee, Lord, that so far as Thy people are concerned, they, uh, uh, they enjoy a good providence. They enjoy the best providence. In many, in many ways, the providence that they enjoy couldn't be better. For thy word tells us that thou dost work all things together for good. It doesn't say some things or most things, but all things. Together for good to those who love thee, who are the called and called to thy path. What a privilege and a blessing thy people enjoy. And that is one of the blessings of the gospel. That is part of the gospel, part of the, uh, the, 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 the blessings that God bestows upon all those who are the call the to his purpose and who love him. Pray us therefore bless us and once again we pray for this congregation and its needs. It's got many needs but at this time one of the greatest needs it has is of a pastor, uh, a minister uh, because of the vacancy that has continued now for that period of time and we pray Lord that efforts that are being made to bring this about, bring this to <coughs> fruition will be prospered by thyself. We know Lord that <coughs> thou hast Thou just know the end from the beginning. And thou hast a purpose for this congregation. But it is not yet revealed to us. It is revealed in time and providence. That we can believe, O oh Lord, because still believe thou hast a good purpose. If we are diligent in seeking thy face uh, in prayer in these matters. For it, it pleases thee, O oh Lord, to appoint pastors and teachers over thy church. It is the pattern. It is the, the, the pattern and the, 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 the provision that God has made. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we in this congregation would be sincerely engaged in prayer to this end. Pray for the gospel preached this day in these parts. And we pray, O oh Lord, as it went forth, that those who heard it would uh, mix it with faith in their hearing. And we thank Thee, Lord, that throughout our land, even although we're living in times of apostasy and declension, there have still been many who have gathered, as we do gather, to worship Thee this day. And as long as sun and moon endure, Thou wilt have a people in this earth to praise thee and to praise thy name. And there is great promises in thy word of a great end gathering. And uh, we have reminded ourselves so often as we should that thy word contains promises not only that we're going to build thy church, but there's going to be a in great end gathering of the ancient people, the Jews. When they are grafted in again to the natural olive tree, it will be a time of blessing to them and a time of life from the dead. And we look forward, O Lord, with expectation, as we should, to this great event. And we pray, Lord, that we would not be left out. When the Jews who have been in apostasy and in unbelief for 2,000 years, when they are brought in, brought in, we pray, Lord, that we would still ourselves be outside, that we would not be outside, but that we would also make our calling and our election sure through obeying the gospel. What a tragedy it be for us who have known the gospel all our days, and then when the Jews are hearing the gospel as they are, but not only hearing it but believing it, that they are believing it and we as Gentiles remain in unbelief. What a tragedy that would be, because I was bestowed great privileges upon the Gentiles. Indeed, it's when the Jews were given over to apostasy, when the branches were lopped off, that uh, foreign branches were then grafted in, the Gentiles were grafted in through the true olive tree, which is the root of uh, the, the root of uh, the, the, the Christian, the gospel and the, and the foundation of the Christian church. Pray that for bless us, Lord, in these things. Bless us as we turn to thy word. We thank thee we have it before us in our language. 
and uh, 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 we pray that we would understand it and that we read it this night and seek to understand it and seek to open it up that we would have that understanding but also an application that we would seek to apply the word to ourselves so often we apply the word to others and it is relevant to others relevant to all men and although it is relevant to others when we hear the word we must consider its relevance to ourselves what does it profit us also if we if, if we think of others heeding the word and we ourselves do not heed it what will it profit us it will profit us nothing but rather it will leave us under the judgment of God and nothing, looking forward only to, to that judgment which is a, a day a day of reckoning a terrible day when God will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he's appointed even his son the Lord Jesus Christ bless us now we pray and continue with us forgive we pray and cleanse us from all sin for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. <laughs> Shall we now continue to worship God by singing to his praise in Psalm 73? Psalm 73. And we shall sing from verse 23. Psalm 73 and sing from verse 23. Nevertheless, continue, Lord, O Lord, I am with thee. Thou dost me hold by my right hand, and still upholdest me. Thou with thy counsel while I live, wilt me conduct and guide, and to thy glory afterward receive me to abide. And so on to the end of the psalm, Psalm 73, singing uh, from verse uh, 23. Nevertheless, continually, O Lord, I am with thee. Nevertheless, continually, O Lord, I we now read in the word of God and in the New Testament and in the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews, well we say epistle to Paul, the book, the epistle to the Hebrews, 
I think most people accept that it was written by Paul. The Epistle to the Hebrews and reading in chapter 9. And we can read from verse 11. Hebrews chapter 9, reading from verse 11. But Christ being, being come and high priest of good things to come, eh, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in, to once he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified through the puring of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament or the New Covenant that by the means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. That's like a will. A will op is operative after the person who makes the will dies. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testator was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things that are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. It uh, was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appointed, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Amen and may God add a blessing to that reading of his own word. And to his name be the praise and the glory. Shall we now continue to worship God by singing in Psalm 43. Psalm 43 and we shall sing the whole psalm to God's praise. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against the ungodly nation. From the unjust and crafty man who be thou my salvation. For thou, the God, art of my strength, why thrust thou me thee fro? For the enemy's oppression, why do I mourn and go? So on, the whole of Psalm 43 to God's praise. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against the ungodly nation. Judge me, O God, and lead my Oh! 
Now shall we turn again to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John in chapter 16, which we are looking at this morning. And we can read the verses again, which we had read, but not all considered this morning. Uh, John chapter 17, 16, and reading from verse 8. And when he is come, that's the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And then verse 11, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Now, we didn't finish it this morning, and I thought, well, we can perhaps try to conclude it this evening. It's very interesting when you consider the work of the Holy Spirit, as mentioned here, there's a progression, isn't there? There's a progression. There's an order in what the Spirit does. Convinced that we covered the first two in the morning, and the two happened more or less at the same time. And also judgment. But in terms of judgment... The ju judgment, the judgment is spoken of, and that's why we read Hebrews, um, Hebrews chapter chapter eight. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after death the judgment. And so far as the history of this world is concerned, not the history. If we can talk about the history, we can't talk about the history of eternity. But in terms of the history of this world, that's the culmination. Everything else that has happened in this world from the creation. Through the, through the prophets and uh, the coming of Christ and the establishing and the spread and the building of the church of Christ, all that comes to a conclusion at the great judgment. We're all heading for that end. It's a solemn thought. It's a solemn thought. And when I read the Bible and the more I understand of the Bible, what a stability it should give us regarding life if you're a believer and if you know and if you believe the bible you are not groping around in the dark wondering what life's all about i mean we can get into this and we're not going to do it even if we were able but uh, on the internet i mean it's a, it's a wonderful tool in many ways there are any number of programs to do with the world and the universe, the history of the universe and the future of the universe. Most of you, a lot of you probably know that. But if you, you can look at what's going to happen to the world. How is the world going? Is the world going to end? How is it going to end? Where is it going to end? You know, all these... Uh, and you get, you'll get learned men. <coughs> In, in certain areas, mathematicians, scientists, physicists, uh, what's the word, cosmologists. They're all discussing these <coughs> things. And they never come to an, a, a conclusion. They never come to a consensus, an agreement. They argue with each other. Some say, well, you see, there could be other universes there. So, oh, no, there's only one universe. And so it goes on and on. Endless questioning, no answers, no certainty. Men searching, learning, but never coming to the truth. That's what the Bible says. Now, we're not despising. We shouldn't despise through learning. We cannot do that. Through learning is from God. But in terms of these questions, if you believe the Bible, you know you're not, you know more than these <coughs> well-qualified professors and many. You know more about it. You know how the world's going to end. And you, you know to some extent when it's going to, not the exact day and the hour, but you know the circumstances. And again, I'm conscious that I can be led into repeating so much. You know the consequences. You know the story, the circumstances. You know what's going to happen. And you certainly know what's going to happen before the world ends. And the world will not end until these things happen. But you know that ultimately this world is going to end in a judgment. Solemn thought. And that's not just some idea. <coughs> it involves you and I. The judgment is not a decision that God's going to make, so to speak, like the sovereign. He is the sovereign. It's going to be a decision that makes reference not just to the world, 
not just to nations, not just to churches, not just to families. It's going to have reference and the judgment is going to be about you and me. When, you, when, when someone is brought before a, ju a judgment, <coughs> uh, a judge's a, a court, where a judge presides in our land, the judge is not going to pronounce, well, it depends what the, the court is, but if someone is accused of some felony or some crime, he's not going to make a, a judgment about the state of the government or the state of the economy or the st what's going to ha happen in other countries. Not, that's not his concern. He's going to give a judgment concerning you. That's what it means. Uh, it's personal. That's why we... We can't dismiss it. But that's also why you should be thankful that you know, I should be, that I know these things. Why? Because I can make preparation. It's appointed unto men once to die. And after death, the judgment. And that's what we're told in our text. There's a lot more we could say here. If I'm moving a wee bit, I was saying today, I've got a wee touch of cramp and it seems to be up in the torso just now. However, uh, that, don't, don't be distracted by that. That's what we're told here. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. And you see, it's all, the order, as I said at the beginning, there's an order. The work of the Spirit is referring to the last day. He shall convict the world of judgment to come, of judgment. And he gives a reason. He, I will, will touch on that, God willing. He gives a reason here. He shall... He shall... Uh, he... Uh, of right of judgment, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And we'll say something about that. So what I'm saying in the outset is this. We've got revelation. We've got truth. We've got knowledge. Not speculation. You didn't have to sit down. You certainly shouldn't sit down and ask, what's going to I wonder what's going to happen to the world. And more importantly, <coughs> what's going to happen to me? That, that would be... That would be an act of unbelief. You know what's going to happen to the world. And you know what's going to happen to you. And what happens to you is that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And that's what the Spirit tells us about. That's what the Spirit reveals to us and convicts us. He will convict us of judgment to come. And you should be thankful for that. Now, how many people will say, don't talk about judgment. There's enough misery in this world, and we're suffering all sorts of problems, <coughs> deprivation. That is true, because God's hand is upon us in judgment. In terms of the cost of living, as we've talked about, talked about all that before. We're not, we're not dismissing these things. We're not dismissing it. But people will say, we've got enough problems to think about. You have problem how to pay our bills, and that is true. Problems about employment. Are we going to keep our jobs? These things are important. We don't dismiss these things. And there's many f problems that families have. My family, they're, they're, they're going astray in so many ways. Their, their family life is breaking up. And how true that is of our society. And so we're going to. Now we're not dismissing these things. These things are important. These, these things will. These, these things have got to be faced. We've got to face these things. But whatever else we face. We must face. And we must reckon with this great truth. That is appointed unto men once to die. And you must be prayer. In other words. You, we are to prepare for many things regarding our cost of living. We try to prepare as best we can regarding to many things. We make preparations for many of the, the duties of this world. But whatever you do, whatever preparations you make, you must make preparations. And I must make preparations for this great day. It's going to settle everything. Because after judgment, you see, there's going to be no change. We said there's going to be no change. Your future and your happiness, and that's one thing we said before. God has made us with a desire for happiness. It's a wonderful thing, that, isn't it? What if we had no capacity for happiness? What, what an existence we would have. But even unconverted people enjoy 
forms of happiness. Absolutely. He fills our hearts with gladness and good things. There are many good things that God gives us in his providence. And as we said in the morning in his coming grace, which gladden the heart of men, not necessarily believers, all men. And how thankful you should be that you've, no matter whether you're a believer, you've enjoyed happiness in this world. Now, there are some people who live miserable lives and prickly. a lot of it's to do with upbringing. Some people have been brought up in, as you know, in dreadful circumstances. And we don't need to go into it. And their happiness probably is very limited. You see down and out people and many others in all sorts of situations. And all of that's to do with their background. And sadly, they're not, we're not saying they're not responsible or accountable. But often that is to do with upbringing. But having said that, so far as most people in the world are concerned, they not only have a capacity for happiness, but they enjoy a measure of happiness. And that has been given to us by God. What a blessing. Have you ever thought of that? What a kindness, what a blessing of God that, that we can be happy. Even in the normal things of life. Now, we'll come to, we'll come to the gospel in a moment. But the point is this, what I'm saying is this. Regarding the judgment and eternity, whatever happiness sinners, and we're all sinners, enjoy in this world, there'll be no, there'll be no happiness for unbelievers in the world to come. And that's our desire. Lee will come to the gospel. That's our desire. We want to be happy. God has put it in our hearts to be happy. We seek other happiness. And again, I conscious I'm repeating myself. I've never met anybody who says I don't want to be happy. I've never. Now there are some who cannot get happiness, obtain happiness, and tragically they think that worth is not life is not worth living. That's a tragedy. But the point is this. There are many blessings, that, and we're all seeking this, and in this world we enjoy something of it. We never obtain as much as we want. We, we always come short of the happiness we're seeking. But let us remind ourselves of this. And this is a negative thing to begin with. If we are unbelievers, from all, for all eternity, think of this, we will enjoy no happiness. What a prospect that is. We will enjoy no happiness. Think of that. So many things we enjoy in this, we don't need to enumerate them. That's what's at stake here. But that, that, that's putting it negatively. <clears throat> there is something positive. Now, positive in the way it's not just a passive thing that there'd be no happiness there. The Bible says that there will be pains there. The pains of hell. That, that's what the judgment means for those who do not believe the gospel. And that's why the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin and of, right, and of judgment to come so that we will seek to escape that judgment. That's what the Bible warns us to do continually. Flee. Flee. This is what Christ said. This is what God said. We're to flee. We're to run. What? Or from what? We're to flee from the wrath which is to come. That's the judgment of God against sin. You might ask the question, why is this? It is necessary. You might say, surely God, if God is a kind and a loving God, why would he bring such, why would he bring us into judgment? Why would he appoint the day, and it's God who's appointed the day. Why would he appoint the day in which he will judge the world? And as we said, it's not just the world at large, it's you and I individually. Why would he do it? If he's a kind God. And he's a God of love. And a merciful God. Why would he do it? Well, we can, it's a big subject. We can approach it in one sense, a big subject. In another sense, it's, it, it's simple. God does it because we've already said the Spirit is going to convict the world of righteousness. Before the judgment, there is righteousness. And we talked about the righteous, the righteous that God, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which is God, convinces the world. The righteous is firstly 
the righteousness of God. That's why there's a judgment. What does that mean? Why do we connect the two? Why are the two connected? Well, we often use the example of our land. There's a righteousness even today in the laws of our land. That righteousness is being reduced almost daily. That is true, but there's still principles of righteousness. That's what the law is supposed to mean and apply. Rightness. And we, if we break the law, we cannot do so with impunity. The law will punish us because that's what the law is there for. There's a form of righteousness, of civil righteousness. But there's a far higher right, as we said, or there's a far higher righteousness than civil righteousness. That's God's righteousness. God is righteous. Whatever he cannot look upon sin, but he's also a just God. Again, that's what the law of the land signifies, justice. The scales of justice. That good must be punished. Sorry, evil must be punished. And so it is with God. He's a, he, he, will in, he will in no wise clear the guilty. Why? Because he's a just God. He's a judge. And let us remember this as well. And all this is connected and it could be presented in many different ways. God has forewarned us about it. Nobody should be taken by surprise. On the day of judgment. Yes, we might not day the, know the day and the hour. But God was forewarned it's going to happen. He's told us. He's told us here. Told us throughout the whole of script, the scriptures. That's when he sent the prophets. Right from the fall of man. And right through history. And then the prophets and through Christ and the apostles. And the preachers who preached the, God, the Bible up to this day. We have it on the pages of scripture. Nobody should come, no one should, 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 I'll put it this way. It should not come, the day of judgment should not come to anyone, certainly any one of us, un, unknown or unexpected. He forewarns us. He tells us about it before it happens. He doesn't always tell us that. There are many things that happen in the world that God hasn't told us about. There's some he does. Some he has. But so far as judgment is concerned, he's made it clear, this is going to happen. There is a day appointed. He knows the day. He knows the hour. And he's told us there is a day. So you can and I can and we cannot feed ignorance. Is that not a testimony to the, the, the kindness, the graciousness of God? And why does he tell us before that? So that we may escape it. That's why we said it. So that we may escape this judgment. We, so we, we may, or, or on the day of, of the day of judgment, we will be able to give an account of ourselves. And remember what we're told in, in the, that day, that we will all appear to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether they be good or bad. How do you feel about that? How do I feel about that? Can you view that? Do you view that? Say, I can do that? I'll be able to give an account of the deeds done. Is that your view? <laughs> what deeds done in the body will God be looking for? We said it in the morning. <coughs> He'd be looking for righteousness. He'd be looking for, right, looking for perfect righteousness. He'd be looking for obedience to the Ten Commandments. That's what be. And you, you and I, we have to give an account. Now the details are not, not revealed to us, but he, he, he may well set before us the Ten Commandments. And we may have to, he may well examine our lives. He will examine our lives in the light of the Ten Commandments. Go through the list of the commandments. Have you kept this one? And even the one, the greatest commandment, which is not contained in the Ten Commandments, First in the greatest commandment, Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind and strength. If that is the first commandment that God brings before us, the day of Johnny, I'm going to give an account for that. Have you done this? Have you loved God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength? Every moment of every day since you were conceived. 
What account will you give? What account? I know the account I will give. And you know the account you will give. You have broken the commandments of God. As we said, the Catechism say, makes it clear to us that uh, we break the commandments of God daily. No mere man since the fall can perfectly keep the commandments of God, but does daily break them in thought, word and deed. That's your, that, that will be your, that, that will be your testimony. That will be your account, that will be my account. And that's what the Holy Spirit comes to do. To convince us of this so that we will be prepared. And we will be able to flee from the wrath to come. So on that day of judgment we shall be openly acknowledged and acquitted. And that, the Bible says that is going to happen. For those who have repented and who have believed the gospel. On that day they will give an account. And after that after that. Judgment, if you like, after that, that it's, it's, a, it's a court, if you like. There's another word for it which escapes me. So, what are we told? We're told that they will be openly acknowledged and acquitted on that day. And we'll come to how that is in a moment. And that's the good news. But the point I'm saying is this, that God has forewarned us. None of us will be able to plead ignorance on that day. And therefore your wisdom and mine is to be prepared. How often does that, what the prophet said, prepare to meet thy God? Why? Because God is a holy God who cannot look upon sin. And the soul that sin shall die. That's why there is a judgment. God is a just judge. And he is he's a, he's, he's a, he's a perfect judge. There's, there's some good judges. We should be thankful for good judges, honest judges in our, in our society. And we've had many down through the generations. None of them have been perfect. But God is a perfect judge. And a judge um, in a court is, is dependent upon evidence. He's dependent upon the evidence that's brought before him. He doesn't know all the evidence. He's dependent upon what is brought before him by a prosecutor by a defender, by the defence. It's limited knowledge, not so with God. Think of this. God knows the end from the beginning. And he knows you from the moment of your conception to the moment of your death. He knows everything about you. He knows your actions. Many know, well, a number of people can know or actually can see them. But he goes deeper than that. He searches and tries us. He searches the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. And many of the greatest and the deepest sins are in our heart, which we would not reveal to anyone. We would not reveal these sins, but they're known to God. And we will have to give an account, because he's a judge. He's in possession of all the facts. He's in possession of all the evidence. And the verdict and the base of the evidence of what you and I have done is a verdict of guilty. We've no defence. Well, there is it. We'll come to the defence. We've no defence. How can you defend yourself on that day of judgment? How can I? Because we've all sinned to come short of the glory of God. So that's what we're told here. The Spirit convicts us, but He gives a reason why. And our, I see our time is gone. He gives a reason here of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Spirit will convince the world of judgment to come because the prince of this world is judged. You see, God, there's already been a judgment. In one, there's already been a judgment. In fact, there are different judgments. But there's already been a judgment. When, but put it this way, we don't want to say it, we can say a lot, but first of all, Christ was judged. He's undergone judgment. Did, we should think of it. He's undergone judgment. He, under, he underwent human judgment. A, a travesty, a corruption of judgment, of justice. But he, under, he was tried at the hands of men. And he was, what happened? What was the verdict? Well, in fact, it's a strange verdict. Strange verdict. The official verdict was one of innocence. It's a remarkable circle. He was tried. The official verdict was one of innocence. 
but there was a penalty. And the innocent was condemned after the verdict was pronounced as it. I find no fault with this man. He was tried. And we'll come to that in a minute. If I find, but there's another judgment. And again, I'm, things are coming to my mind now as I just go through this. Then he was on the cross of Calvary. And what are we told there? It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put into you. On, on Calvary, Christ was being not only judged, he was condemned. Why was he condemned? Because he was bearing sin. He was condemned. And who was he condemned by? It wasn't the sin that the Jews accused him of. Pilate didn't accuse him of these sins. The Jews did. These weren't the sins that Christ was being judged for on, on the cross. It pleased the Lord to he was being sin he was being bruised for the sins of others. We touched on something of that in Hebrews. He who knew no sin, that is Christ, he who knew no sin was made sin for us. Who made him sin for us? Was it the Jews? Was it Pilate? No, it was God the Father. God the Father made him sin for us. Didn't make him sinful. But it meant that he undertook the guilt of sin. Or he accept he he and uh, yes, he received. The guilt of sin. Because God had laid upon him, laid upon Christ, the iniquity of us all. And because God had laid upon Christ the iniquity, it was God who judged Christ. So there's another judgment. On, on, the, on Calvary, and there's another judgment on Calvary. We'll come to that, and that's in our text. So here is the Son of God being judged and being condemned. Not for his own sin, but the sin of a, You might say, that's unjust. That's unjust for the law, for the judge to condemn a man for sins he didn't commit. There are issues there, aren't there? Christ was an innocent man. Yet he endured the pains of hell. That was the penalty of the sin. That was the judgment of God against Christ. He experienced, he bore the pains of hell. And yet he was innocent. Some would say, surely that is unjust. It's the grossest injustice. Well, we don't, try to, we don't not want to go too much into it. But the point is this. <clears throat> the sin of Adam has been imputed to his posterity. You might say, how unjust that is. I did not disobey God in eating the forbidden fruit. And yet, that the guilt of Adam's first transgression has been imputed to me as part of original sin. And some say, how unfair that is. Well, we, we could say a lot about that. Adam stood for you and I on, that, on the day in which he fell and the day he was, the day he was created. He stood for you and I. To undo the fall of man. Christ stood as a second Adam. He stood as a representative for those who trust him. So you see, it cancels out. It cancels out. Unless the sin and the guilt of sinners was imputed to Christ, and then he suffered for them, there could be no salvation, no forgiveness of sin. It cancels out the original imputation. Of the sin of Adam to his posterity. Because the righteousness of Christ, the obedience of Christ, the suffering of Christ is imputed to his spiritual posterity. All those who trust and obey him. So there's a judgment. But there's another judgment here. That's what our text says here. It's another judgment. And they're all connected. And of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. When was, when was Satan? Satan is the prince of the, He's the god of this world. He's the father of lies. And when you think of the... Have you ever thought of the guilt of Satan? Have you ever thought of the guilt of Satan? Your, your guilt and my guilt is great. Can your guilt and my guilt be compared to the guilt of Satan? What guilt does Satan have? You, Satan was the deceiver. He was the liar. 
Yes, Adam bears the guilt of listening to the lie and believing the lie. That is true. But the lie didn't come from Adam. The lie came from Satan. You shall be as gods. What guilt attaches to the judgment of Satan? And what we're told here is this, that on the cross of Calvary, Christ, not only was Christ judged by God to bear the sins of many, but Satan was judged. That's what we're told in Scripture. Satan being the being the, uh, the originator of sin in the sense of temptation and lies, he is now being judged by Christ. What a... How much Satan knew about all these things is not clear to understand. But he certainly believed. He wanted to... The, the crucifixion is made clear, the crucifixion of Christ. Satan believed that it was his work. He entered into Judas. And he, his desire... His, his desire was to crucify Christ, Satan. He didn't realize, and this is the mystery, he didn't realize that this was the, ultimately the purpose of God. Yes, we're told in, in Peter preached on this on the day of Pentecost, that he said that you, that's the Jews there, you have taken Christ from the wicked hands, have crucified and you've slain him. But then he raises us up to to God. This was the this is what happened so far as human beings from the That was their intention or purpose. Peter is but he says it was by the definite, determinate counsel. That's the plan. The def determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. This was part of the plan of God. But they were talking now not of the crucifixion, the punishment, the judgment of God, the judgment of Satan. You see, in, in being crucified, Christ was undoing the work of Satan. This is how we're told, this is how we're told that in Scripture, I haven't mentioned the text here, but we're told here, what did Christ do? He destroyed him! Destroyed him who had the power of death, even the devil. That was the work of Christ. When he was crucified in weakness, apparent weakness, in one sense, human weakness, what could be more character what could be more associated with human weakness than pain? None of us would choose pain if we could avoid it. Christ endured pain, physical pain, that was his weakness. But he endured, as we said many times, the pains of hell. That was Christ. That was Christ there. But in doing that, and as we said, he, he, although he was, he, he was, and how much Satan, how much Satan used, not clear. I'm quite, I'm prepared to accept that he believed that he was successful. Satan probably believed, he, I'm successful here. I'm destroying Christ. I'm destroying this person who I know is the son of God. I'm destroying him. And it will be that he, he knew that Satan came to save sinners and he may have felt, well, if I put him to death or if, if I'm instrumental in his crucifixion, then he will not, he will not save, he, he cannot save sinners. But you see, the very purpose and intention of Satan was the means that God used to save sinners. Because rather than destroying Christ, Christ was destroying Satan. He was destroying it, and he was destroying the work of Satan, which was sin, the, the entry of sin into the world. That was the work of Satan. And Christ came to destroy him with the power of death, even the devil, and sin and death, Christ came to destroy that and bring life and immortality to light through the gospel. That's what we're told here. He destroyed him with the power of death, even the devil. Now there's a lot more, and I'm very conscious that <coughs> there's a lot more that could be said and could be said far better. But there we have the work of the Holy Spirit. Much, much more than the Holy Spirit does in its work. But these are the specific works that Christ specifies when he comes. He will convince the world of sin 
and of righteousness, and, of, and they're all connected. And we, and I think we've tried to show that they're all connected. In a sense, righteous, there's no conviction of sin without righteousness. There's no conviction of sin without uh, a conviction of righteousness. And when we're convicted of righteousness, we're also convicted of judgment to come. The penalty, the guilt of sin. So what, what are we saying here? Well, we're saying we should concentrate on what Christ was doing in Calvary. He was being judged there, but he was even judged by God the Father. And on the day of judgment, to get back to the day of judgment, what is your case? Is there a case? Can we have a case? Can we have a defense on the day of judgment? Yes, we can. What is the defense on the day of judgment? The defense is this. Now, how much of this will be said, we don't know. But you and I as a sinner will say this. If the charge sheet, we don't know exactly, the books will be opened, and we don't know how much sin of individuals will be mentioned, <coughs> certainly how much sin of believers. Some will say that the sins of believers will not be brought up in the Day of Judgment, but not all agree with that. But if the sins, if your sins and mine, are brought up in the Day of Judgment as a charge sheet, what will you say to them? Firstly, you'll say this. It's all true. It's all true. Now, nothing will be missing. In a court of law, you can say that, and they say there's a lot more that could be added. You don't need to because the charge sheet will be complete. That's the first thing. We will, we will acknowledge it. We will acknowledge our, 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 our sin before, before God. We'll acknowledge it before God. That, that is the charge sheet. Does that mean then we're condemned? That's what the charge sheet means, we're condemned. No! I acknowledge these are my sins. However, there is one who has paid the penalty for my sin. He has stood in my place and he has borne the wrath and the punishment of God for me against these sins. And he is the one who is here in this court. He is my advocate. He is my intermediary. He's my mediator. He's the one who's there. And this is not some human person. He's a divine human person, none, none less than the Son of God. He took my place and he has paid the penalty and all these sins have been atoned for. And in the sight of God, there is no guilt. There is no guilt because Christ has borne it away. That is the answer. That, that is the, the case. There is, an, there is an answer to these charges on the Day of Judgment. And the question for you and I is this. Is that your answer? Is that my answer? If you're a Christian, that is what you're trusting on. As we said in the morning, we've said we're not looking to our own righteousness. We're not going to try to defend them. We don't try to defend ourselves against the charges. They're clear. They're known. We admit them, but we don't stop there. We say there's one who has stood in my place. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was placed upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. That's the testament. That's the gospel. Is that your testament? Is that your hope on this great day of judgment? We're told about it here. Certain it's coming. And we must all appear on that day to give an account. And that is the account that satisfies God. God is satisfied. And on that day, what are we told? All believers are openly acknowledged. Acknowledge as believers, acknowledge as the children of God. Openly acknowledged and acquitted. There'll be a public acquittal. And the acquittal is not guilty or guilty, but the penalty has been paid. My justice, I'm here, and the hope of saying this, I am here as the judge of all the world. I'm a just judge, and I'm a righteous judge, and I'm an omniscient judge. I know all the facts, and so far as I am concerned, my justice has been satisfied. I'm satisfied. I've no charge against you. The, the law, my law, has nothing against you. It's been satisfied by Christ. 
He's borne the law and he's borne the penalty of the law, which is the wrath of God, the pains of him. He's borne it. There's no charge left standing. What a prospect. What a pro Not just a prospect. This is true now, but we're talking about the day of judgment. But if you are a believer in Christ tonight, that is true of you. You can say that. I can say that. Although I'm a sinner, there is a Saviour who has paid the penalty for my sin, even the Lord Jesus Christ. And so far as eternal guilt is concerned, it's been taken away. Christ has borne it. He's borne it, and there is no longer any law. And the broken law that condemns me. No condemnation. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That is the gospel. Now, I'm conscious that it can be put far better than that. That's the gospel. We know that. And the question for you now is this, as it always is, are we prepared for this, for these, the, 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 these changes? And particularly, are we prepared for the judgment of God? What an assize that is. Think of this. We don't want to just deal with details. Oh, we told the truth. I don't know how many graveyards there are in this parish. There's many, 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 many graves. They're all going to be opened. Think of that. And the dead are going to rise. People scoff at that. Well, they were scoffing when Noah was building the ark until the rain came. That's going to happen. What a day that is. And the whole world are going to assemble before the throne of God. You have an old rich and poor. And you will be there, I will be there. And there'll be a separation between the sheep and the goats. And these are those who believe in Christ and those who have not believed in Christ. May therefore you and I be wise. May we be wise. Why should we die? That's the plea the, the prophets made to Israel. Turn, you tell you, why shall you die? What, choose life. Choose life and not death. The way of life and the way of death is set before us in the gospel. May we be wise and by the grace of God, may we choose life. Which means trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of our sin, confessing it before God, and embracing and resting upon Christ for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. Now our time really is gone, so we'll conclude now with our closing psalm of praise in psalm 63 psalm 63 and we shall sing from the beginning of the psalm psalm 63 is singing from the beginning Lord thee my God I early seek my soul shall the thirst for thee my flesh longs in a dry parched land wherein no waters be. <coughs> that I thy power may behold the brightness of thy face, as I have seen thee heretofore within thy holy place. And so on. Sing down to the end of verse 8. Uh, Psalm 63 from the beginning. Lord thee, my God, I early seek. My soul a thirst for thee. Lord thee, my God, I seek. My
pray, Lord, that Thou wouldst go before us. We pray, Lord, that we would make preparation for that great day, that great change, which is coming to all of us when we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We thank Thee on that day Thy people have an advocate. They have a representative so that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Oh Lord, we pray we would all seek that protection, seek that salvation which is offered to us freely. Continue with us now and pardon our sin, for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.